All right, for those of you who've made it, this is our this is the only panel that stands between us and a reception where there should be alcohol. Um, so uh, as you know, I keep these uh, introductions uh, quite short. This is a uh, quite a distinguished panel. So we have, starting from my left, um, Howard Shalansky, who has done uh, many different things, been chief economist at the, at the FCC, is now the head of OIRA. And I bet everybody in this room knows what OIRA is, so I'm not even going to spell it out for you. Uh, John Nectarline, who also has done many things and is now the general counsel uh, at the FTC. Uh, and Ruth Milkman, who has uh, headed the wireless bureau, headed, had many different positions in the FCC, and is now uh, the FCC chief of staff. They're going to talk uh, in that order. And as before, each of them will talk for about 10 minutes. We'll let them respond to each other. We'll open it up for questions. If you have questions, the best way, as usual, is to email them to this address. And that way, I can know the questions as they're, um, as they're coming in. Uh, without any, and you all should be encouraged to come up here, but if you're not required, you can sit there or you can you come up here. Uh, without any further ado, Howard. There we go. OK. Um, thanks so much, Stuart, and it's, it's great to be here and to see so many uh, uh, old friends in the audience as well. Um, let me just start by saying I am not authorized to speak about any of today's topics on behalf of the administration, so I want to be very clear. I'm not here in my official capacity. I'm here because um, good friends of mine organized a great conference with terrific co-panelists. Um, so uh, please don't attribute my remarks to uh, uh, anybody other than myself. What I thought I would do is uh, set the stage a little bit. And if we're looking ahead to what internet regulation or telecommunications generally might look like in 2020 uh, or uh, sort of going forward, I, I think it's useful to go backwards a little bit and see what the evolution has been uh, in telecommunications regulation and the way we think about telecommunications regulation. And then I'll identify what I think some of the considerations are uh, as we move forward. So I'm going to give a a sort of broad framing talk uh, to be followed by something uh, specific and no doubt a lot more sensible for my co-panelists. So I think that the, uh, the salient change in uh, telecommunications regulation over the past few decades uh, has been a shift from controlling monopoly to facilitating or preserving competition. And I think that this is actually a change that's occurred generally uh, in American uh, industries uh, I actually commend an article from about 15 years ago written by uh, Joseph Kearney and Tom Merrill, uh, probably, I think, in the Columbia Law Review, called The Great Transformation of American Industries Regulation or Regulated Industries Law or something like that. It's a terrific article that frames very broadly how we've started to change the conversation on regulation. And I think telecommunications is a really great example. If we look at the Telecommunications Act of 1996, what that act was really about was saying, look, we've spent a long time sort of assuming that there was this monopoly to be regulated. And often that assumption was sort of very, so blindly followed that even when there were uh, aspects of the end-to-end -end telecommunications or telephone monopoly that clearly didn't fit the idea of a natural monopoly, clearly should have been places where competition should come in, uh, the regulators stepped in and said, nope, it's an end-to-end -end monopoly and really uh, made competition extremely difficult in places where, where it should have developed rather freely. And I think that we see a, a dawning, a, a dawning uh, sort of realization that this was not good policy as the FCC, um, not to say it too strongly, but essentially capitulated during the Bell breakup, confessed that they had not been very effectively regulating the Bell monopoly and uh, got on board with the Justice Department's action uh, against AT&T. That really set the stage eventually for getting to, um, uh, getting to uh, the 1996 Act, which really was at its essence about preempting state monopoly franchises and figuring out what the mechanisms would be for actually creating competition in lines of business that the regulators and Congress and uh, the American system was no longer willing to assume should be monopolies. And what was interesting is um, for a long time, people said, OK, there are lots of aspects of the telecom system that are suitable for competition, equipment, uh, information services, long distance telephony. 
but certainly the local exchange networks were, uh, were, were natural monopolies. And what the 1996 Act said was no, uh, they're not. So over the course of this evolution, for legacy services and for incumbent providers, one set of key questions that emerged um, uh, for, for regulators involved the point at which regulators could start to remove or forbear from enforcing regulations that had long uh, applied to those services and providers. So removals of tariffs, rate flexibility, and other movements away from traditional regulation uh, occurred first in long distance calling and then eventually moved to other services starting uh, in the 1980s. Um, but a second set of questions emerged in the regulation of incumbent carriers, notably their obligations towards competitors and providers of new upstream and downstream services. Um, so I think that while we began to see regulatory scrutiny diminishing on the retail end, uh, there became a real focus on uh, the wholesale access side of telecommunications regulation. And if we look back through the telescope from today, that seems, well, of course, that's what we think about most of the time now in telecommunications regulation. If we think about most of the salient regulatory battles, they're at an access level or a wholesale level. We're a lot less concerned with the retail level, but that was really a change that happened uh, in a fairly compressed uh, time period. And uh, I think in, um, uh, in regulating, uh, looking at these remaining pieces of, of monopoly in the network and, and shifting from retail scrutiny to wholesale access as ways to break up those remaining pockets of monopoly, uh, the FCC had a number of concerns. And I think one of the key concerns that emerged was how do we give potential new providers access to the incumbents without either making that access so cheap that new entrants don't invest in new kinds of facilities, um, so deterring investment by the new entrants, or making it so cheap that it is effectively punitive on the incumbent networks so they don't bother investing in anything, anything that they're then going to have to cheaply unbundle. Uh, so the FCC early on began to draw a distinction between new kinds of facilities and legacy facilities in regulating competitors' access to incumbent, incumbent network facilities. And I think roughly speaking, we can say that the FCC declined to regulate incumbents' new or advanced kind of facilities um, and tried to limit the, the unbundling to legacy kinds of facilities um, that, that were either amortized or were not the locus of a lot of new innovation. And I think the underlying idea was that with respect to new kinds of digital facilities, the playing field was reasonably level. So just for example, an incumbent might have to unbundle capacity on a legacy switch, but not on a new IP router. With respect to leg legacy facilities, incumbents would have to unbundle those at the same cost-based ba rate where necessary for rivals to get into the marketplace. Now, obviously, the distinction between old and new kinds of facilities was not, was not totally clean. There are possibilities to gain the system by replacing old kinds of switches with new rider, routers to provide essentially the same service. These were issues that arose for a while. But I think over time, two really hard sets of questions began to emerge. One set of questions for what I would call the old facilities and services, and one for the new facilities and services. For the old legacy facilities and services, I think a key, point, a key question was the point at which wholesale access could no longer be called necessary for competition. When would unbundling be able to stop? And I think that the key question here was what metrics should be used to determine the development of, quote unquote, sufficient competition? At what point was there enough such competition in the market that you could say to the incumbent, uh, you're, 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 you're free? Um, another question is, at what point could a service itself be called unnecessary for competition? You know, I used to for a very long time when I would get up in front of a class starting in the mid-90s, I'd say, well, how many of you have fixed home telephone lines? And, you know, in the mid to late 90s, it was the vast majority of the class. Um, somewhere around the mid, you know, the middle of this last decade, you know, 2004, 2005, nobody raised their hand. All right. Um, what do we think then of, you know, POTS? plain old telephone service. Is that a necessary service for competition anymore? Um, my home phone actually went out after a storm because a tree knocked down my fancy Fios line. Now, that was sort of a pain in the neck because, you know, I've got a teenager and lack of internet access is worse than lack of water or food. But, um, 
uh, I will tell you that it was a matter of complete indifference in terms of basic communication because uh, we all had our wireless network, our, our wireless phones, our devices. So, um, you know, at what point is the service itself unnecessary for competition? And that really is at root the question I just sort of alluded to, when should intermodal competition, i.e. wireless versus wireline, be deemed sufficient to stop worrying about wireline competition? And if you go back just 10 years, you see the FCC really worrying about these questions. Should we consider wireless when we're thinking about unbundling obligations? Is wireless a real substitute? There are all kinds of big surveys going on, you know, the Pew, uh, the Pew Center putting out, you know, cutting the cord. You know, can we really, uh, can we really consider wireless a, a, a competitor? So these are the kinds of questions that I think began to emerge uh, for, for, for legacy uh, systems. For new services, I think a key question was whether competition was developing well enough that regulators could maintain their initial posture of forbearance. Uh, or whether regulation was proving to be necessary for new kinds of services. And I think if we look at internet access, particularly broadband access, uh, we, see, we see this uh, evolution uh, very clearly. We start with Bill Kennard saying, you know, in 1999, we're not going to regulate the broadband market. We don't have a monopoly. We don't have a duopoly. We have a noopoly. This thing's just getting started. We're not regulating. We have Michael Powell a few years later, when it's pretty clear there's a market there and it's moving along pretty well, saying, well, how about some guidelines? Let's put out the four freedoms. Let's use you know, the bully pulpit. And here we are a bunch of years later, and we've got Julius Janikowski, now Tom Wheeler, and the FCC, and you know, obviously the administration being very public about support for network neutrality regulation. Now, I don't want to talk specifically about network neutrality, but if we think about that as an evolution in the chapter of broadband regulation, we see a new service, a posture of non-regulation, and then gradually coming back and asking whether forbearance and all the classifications of those services that would allow effectively complete forbearance were the right way to go. We see a rethinking of this. And I think this is, um, uh, this is sort of a, an, in an interesting thing to happen in, uh, in the telecom world, a world that was so regulated and then began to move to thinking about where we can deregulate. Then we start with the services that really started unregulated or deregulated and we're coming back at it from the other end. Um, were our assumptions correct? Is there enough competition or do we need to engage in uh, some kind of regulation? And as we think about that, a bunch of questions. What metrics should we use? How many how much capacity, how many different providers, how many alternative kinds of ways through the backbone um, are enough competition? Um, I think of a paper that came out of uh, OPP at the commission, you know, in 2000, 1999 or 2000, Michael Kendi's paper on deregulation of the internet backbone, sort of talking about, you know, the peering arrangements that had arisen, the fact that there were effectively four you know, top tier backbones as being grounds for non-regulation of the backbone. Commercial relationships, facilities, the kinds of providers and the kinds of services that inhabit what we might loosely call that backbone have changed radically. Is that a cause for further, uh, for, for, for further doubling down on deregulation? or have some problems arisen for, uh, for regulation uh, that would require regulation. And when we're thinking about this, the real question is regulation of what? Competition in what? And I think John Sallet's talk was terrific in highlighting um, some things we might want to think about there. What is an MVPD? What is video as a product? How do we have to reconceptualize what that product is and what people are competing in as we think about whether to regulate uh, or not? Once we figure out what the product is, we go back to the metrics question. When is there enough competition? And this has been a, you know, really a very difficult question. Every time the commission comes up with a benchmark for what is quote unquote enough competition to forbear, say in long distance under 271 uh, of, of the 96 Act, or you know, back, uh, back when it came uh, you know, in cable, all right, a third of subscribers have moved to something other than the incumbent cable network. You can, you, you can start to lift some restrictions. These are effectively arbitrary cuts. Are they the right, right cuts? There's something we need to think about. So how regulators should answer the, the above questions? What metrics to use? How to regulate when things are changing quickly? 
um, involves a set of intertwined questions that I just want to tee up. I think that the most central question is what kind of risks and therefore what kinds of errors do we as a society prefer to run when regulating various kinds of telecommunications networks or services? Where do we want to tilt towards under enforcement and where towards uh, over enforcement? I'm not sure there's really a right answer and I'm not sure economics necessarily gets you to the answer to that question. I'll, I'll come back to that in just one second. But clearly there are very different preferences, risk preferences in different societies for over-regulation versus under-regulation. The Europeans clearly in most uh, individual member states of the European Union and at the European Commission level have articulated a preference for um, uh, risks of over-enforcement. They want to avoid risks of under-enforcement. So while I wouldn't say that there's some kind of crazy regulatory juggernaut, some people would disagree, I know, uh, we see both in competition enforcement and in regulation a more precautionary approach, willing to put burdens more on uh, the parties to justify conduct than adopting economic presumptions that that kind of conduct is beneficial or efficient. Um, more, of, uh, more of a concern to get out of, uh, to, 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 to limit what incumbents can do, even if that might have some short run investment effects or even long run investment effects, than to lose the possibility of short run competition. And I think there, what motivates that is a view that markets can tip and tilt. And if you don't regulate now, you have the equivalent of monopoly driving one way over those nasty tire spikes and regulation being unable to pull it back. So I think that's sort of the animating image of the um, let's avoid under enforcement school of thought. I think we have more of a tradition in the US, it hasn't always been so, but I think generally we have a more of a tradition in the United States of avoiding risks of over enforcement and of over regulation, at least on the competition side. And so the question is, in this new world where we shifted focus from regulating the retail monopoly to regulating access and facilitating competition, what's our animating risk calculus going to be? Are we going to tilt more towards avoiding errors of over-enforcement that might deter innovation by the incumbents and investment by the incumbents? Or are we going to focus more on retain more of our old regulatory approach and tilt more towards facilitating competition um, ensuring that we do not have people discriminated against and blocked out, even if there might be some costs. Um, finally, I just want to I want to end on 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 one 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 note. I think that question of which kind of risk we we want to run and where of under enforcement versus over enforcement has a lot to do with what our regulatory framework is going to be institutionally. Do we want ex ante rules of the kind that the FCC is most experienced in? Um, in, 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 in providing for carriers, sort of rules of the road, ex ante rules from which you have to seek forbearance? Or do we want more of an ex post approach of the kind that John's agency, the FTC, is used to applying, where people come and say, we know there's no ex ante rule, but there's some general, uh, general rules against anti-competitive or anti-discriminatory activity, and this guy violated it in this case. So that's one approach we'd want to go. So I think that as we move towards thinking about this, we're thinking not just about what kind of errors we want to run, where we want to regulate and don't want to regulate, how we want to regulate through ex ante rules versus ex post enforcement, but we also might be thinking very much about what kind of regulator we want, a sector specific regulator or a more general uh, competition type authority uh, to, uh, to, to have the, the main role in telecommunications regulation going forward. So um, I think that uh, where things stand today is that we have a number of key challenges that um, the deregulatory trend in telecommunication should not be viewed as being reversed by discussions about network neutrality because the internet started in a very different place. It started in the let's presume no regulation in this era of thinking about facilitating competition rather than the uh, era of restraining monopoly. And then let's see what happens. I think we're still seeing what's happening uh, in, in, in the world of the internet. Uh, so as we move towards 2020, uh, I would not be surprised to actually see more regulation uh, than we have seen since Bill Kennard's 1999 noopoly. 
uh, uh, speech, but I wonder if that will be regulation that is of the traditional ex post kind or of a more case by, uh, excuse me, traditional ex ante kind or um, a, a newer sort of more nuanced ex post case by case kind. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm John Nectarline. I'm going to begin exactly the way that Howard did, which is to say that um, I have an institutional affiliation in Washington. I am not here in that capacity. I'm not authorized to say anything I'm about to say. I'm speaking only as a private citizen. And as will soon become evident, I'm going to talk about issues that are of no particular um, focus of, of my agency. In, in particular, I'm going to talk today about um, what you might call interconnection policy in 2020. Um, I see three main issues, that each of which I'm going to address as briefly as I can. Um, one you, has been called VoIP to VoIP interconnection. Two, uh, paid peering controversies involving so-called eyeball ISPs. And third, concerns about peering impasses between tier one networks threatening balkanization of the internet. Um, in each case, as I'll discuss, the FCC has chosen jawboning over outright regulation, and I'll conclude that that is probably the optimal policy at this point. Um, let's, let's begin with the beginning, uh, the Telecom Act of 19, the Communications Act of 1934. When telecom lawyers hear the term interconnection, they typically think about circuit-switched voice networks. They think about classic interconnection on the PSTN. Uh, that is subject to 100 plus years of federal and before that state regulation. Uh, that form of regulation is subject to pervasive price terms plus the physical details of how two networks should interconnect on an engineering level. But when internet engineers hear about uh, interconnection, they um, don't think about a regulatory scheme at all. They think about peering and transit arrangements, which are typically contractual and privately ordered. Uh, they are not regulated. So far, there have been only occasional um, controversies in the world of internet peering and, and transit, and I will return to those in a little bit. What's interesting about um, the point in time we occupy now is that um, within the next half dozen years or so, I think most people expect that voice uh, will know that the traditional circuit switch voice network will be to some extent retired, and voice will ride um, over internet protocol platforms, even either in an over-the-top format as, as Skype and Vonage do today, or in a managed uh, VoIP network of the type that Comcast or AT&T Uverse uh, provide. And there are critical questions about, the, um, F about FCC policy in that world that are before the FCC today. This is in the set of proceedings colloquially known as the IP transition. Um, let's talk about, I'm going to briefly mention some key issues that are not related to interconnection, only because I want to focus on interconnection. There are critical issues involving numbering administration in the new world. Um, the, the, the industry and or the government needs to come together to find a global solution to the problem of um, converting 10-digit telephone numbers into IP addresses so that VoIP users anywhere on the internet can find VoIP users anywhere else on the network and no longer have to do what they do today, which is inefficiently convert their, VoIP, their IP signals into circuit switch format simply so that they know how to find other users um, of the network. Um, the FCC will obviously also need to play a key role in establishing um, E911 arrangements so that in an all IP environment, it will be easy to find first responders in your neighborhood. Um, there are also questions of disabilities access and universal service. But I'm talking today about interconnection policy, so I want to drill down on that a little bit. Um, the question is whether we will need a separate interconnection policy for voice independent of interconnection policy for the Internet generally. And it's important to stress at the beginning that I'm not talking about transitional issues that have occupied regulators today about how who pays the cost of converting from IP to TDM and back again. I'm, I'm not talking about those transitional issues. Instead, I'm talking about in the year 2020 or 2025, when there are no more TDM uh, uh, switches and there are no more tandem switches from the legacy PSTN that these VoIP calls go through, will there need to be a regulatory solution to the problem of interconnection. 
Let me begin my answer by making a quick observation about that. I mean, every day, millions of calls go through uh, between Skype users uh, who are uh, using their Skype service on top of the physical networks of disparate ISPs. So if I call you on Skype from my Verizon account and you're using Comcast or CenturyLink or Sprint, um, my call will go through to you using those underlying physical networks, but the underlying physical networks are interconnecting through unregulated peering and transit arrangements. There is no regulatory oversight of that. Um, so on the physical layer, for that sort of over-the-top VoIP experience, interconnection is not a regulatory problem. Of course, there might well be over the long-term interoperability issues if one VoIP provider withholds its customer directories from another, but that is a higher layer concern that's independent of physical interconnection, which has been the customary focus of federal interconnection policy. So does this mean that 100 years of voice-based interconnection obligations uh, will become obsolete with the I IP transition? And the answer is still unclear, and it is probably there, – there are – strong arguments that the answer is perhaps not, because whether or not you need supervised interconnection depends in part on whether policymakers perceive a need to maintain a system of segregated voice traffic to ensure the predictability and reliability of voice communications. That is one of the core issues uh, presented by the so-called IP transition proceeding, uh, currently in its earliest stages of the FCC, and uh, it will increasingly dominate telecommunications debate. So. Let me put VoIP to one side and now turn to non-VoIP specific interconnection issues that will confront the FCC between now and 2020. Uh, since the dawn of the commercial internet in the early 1990s, the FCC has avoided regulating internet peering and transit arrangements and has shown a marked reluctance even to enter that area. But how do we square that non-regulatory tradition with the general premise of telecom regulation, which is the disparities in market power among providers do require interconnection oversight at least for voice traffic. Um, Howard referred to a great white paper called The Digital Handshake by Michael Kendi, which, was, which the FCC issued in um, the year 2000. Uh, it's still kind of a, a very current document. It's well worth a read. Um, he explains why the market for peering in transit on the internet has performed efficiently, why we see efficient interconnection arrangements in the absence of government regulation. And I can sort of distill the reasons into a couple. Um, one basic difference between the PSTN and the internet is that in the PSTN, interconnection obligations were central because of the hierarchical architecture of the traditional telephone network and the relatively small number of options for indirect interconnection. There's, in contrast, on the, in, on the internet, Indirect interconnection via transit has long been the norm, and the transit market is highly competitive. So at least where quality of service is not a particular concern, that dynamic allows any network, no matter how small, to aggregate with other transit purchasers and via their transit providers negotiate on competitive terms with the largest peer networks. There is, however, a growing debate, um, and Sharon Gillette mentioned it this morning, about whether eyeball ISPs raise special market power concerns in the peering and transit context. This, the scenario in which that issue arises is as follows. Content providers such as Netflix or third-party content delivery networks such as Level 3 may wish to interconnect directly with an eyeball ISP, a term I use just to describe um, an ISP like Comcast or Verizon that, um, whose uh, local networks are primarily consumers who view content. Um, and the CDN or the content provider might want such direct interconnection, both because it's most efficient to interconnect that way, given the volume of traffic, and because minimizing the number of hops from the content source to the content destination is one way to improve quality of service for, for video traffic. The, IS, the eyeball ISP, though, might demand a payment for such direct interconnection, that's a fairly new arrangement, new in the sense of about 10 or a dozen years old, uh, known as paid peering. And some argue that the, uh, and I think Sharon uh, voiced this concern this morning, that eyeball ISPs can extract inefficiently high rents because, um, according to this theory, they have market power in the situation where they're negotiating directly with the interconnecting content provider. 
Others respond that the widespread availability of transit alternatives for the content provider, in other words, in lieu of direct interconnection, will keep paid peering prices at economically efficient levels. It's a fascinating set of issues. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're going to see this debate emerge with greater prominence than it has to date over the next half dozen years. Uh, the FCC noted the debate in its 2010 Open Internet Order in uh, what many of us recall as a non-committal one-sentence footnote. Um, but the issue is not going away, and, and uh, particularly with the flattening of the Internet's topology and the exponential growth of One Direction video content. So the third and final interconnection issue that I want to address today is um, uh, a, a set of concerns that the unregulated nature of Internet interconnection arrangements between networks generally could theoretically uh, create a potential for uh, at least temporary Internet fragmentation. Um, in particular, there's the possibility that, um, and this has happened occasionally, the two tier one networks, which um, tier one networks are those that don't buy transit services from other networks, will reach an impasse in their peering negotiations and cut off their customers from each other. Um, the most prominent examples of this are uh, cases where level three and cogent um, disconnected there uh, in 2005. And again, in 2008, level three, I, I'm sorry, uh, Sprint and Cogent uh, reached a peering impasse in 2008. Um, theoretically, such tier one peering impasses could lead to outright internet balkanization. I think there was a period of several hours when one of the network's customers were unable to reach certain customers of the other network. Um, th theoretically, it's scary so far. However, the impasses have been short-lived and, and somewhat mild in their consequences, in part because um, I, IT engineers at uh, the major customers of these networks uh, engage more in more widespread multi-homing than they might have originally. And so being cut off from what network doesn't necessarily mean that they're cut off entirely from the full, um, from the full internet if they can make use of a different ISP in cases of emergency. Uh, currently, neither the FCC nor any other agency has any mechanisms for resolving this type of impasse if one arises and becomes intractable. Um, but it's also not entirely clear that we want to create an explicit established regulatory backstop uh, to private negotiations. Uh, the mere availability of such a backstop, such as binding arbitration a la retransmission consent, would fundamentally alter the bargaining dynamic between networks and might well interfere with the competitive forces that have generally kept peering and transit markets nimble and efficient to this point. There's also an international dimension to this concern. We don't want to encourage, for example, other countries to begin imposing peering and transit regulation of their own. Um, in particular, we do not want countries to start imposing termination charges on US originated traffic. This has been a, an increasing concern over several years. So, for each of the interconnection issues I've talked about here, uh, VoIP to VoIP interconnection, eyeball uh, ISP issues, and tier one peering impasses, the FCC has exhibited a commendable wait and see attitude. Um, that's mainly because the issues presented are technologically fluid and exceptionally complex. It's also unclear uh, to date whether any scheme of FCC regulation or government-led regulation more generally would improve on private ordering. Um, at the same time, the FCC has also commendably invoked um, the time-honored passive virtue of jawboning, reminding providers that it's watching the market and will intervene if a demonstrated need appears. Um, and I look forward to uh, St Stewart's conference in 2020, where we'll be talking about Internet regulation 2025, and I suspect that all three of these issues will still be current at that time. Thank you. Thanks. So at the risk of talking about something completely different, I actually wanted to talk about spectrum policy for a little bit, and then I'm sure we'll come back and engage on the issues that Howard and John have raised. One of the questions that Stuart posed for this panel is, how do you determine which regulatory decisions should be made now and which should be deferred until a later date so that you have the advantage of knowing what future developments are? And this is 
a fantastic question and one that every government agency needs to focus on. We all have limited resources. If we're spending resources on one thing, it means something else gets moved to the back burner. So I've spent most of my time in the last couple of decades working on spectrum policy. And my experience of the last five years in particular has brought into sharp relief the fact that for certain aspects of spectrum policy, particularly reallocation of spectrum and more recently sharing with the federal government, there are very, very long lead times. And so I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about why policymakers need to focus in the near future about making decisions that will enable the availability of spectrum in 2020. So when I came back to the commission in 2009 and with Bruce Gottlieb, who's in the back row there, um, we were at an inflection point. The last major auction had been held in 2008. There was no more spectrum in the pe pipeline for mobile broadband. At the same time, we were seeing the following marketplace and technological developments. The iPad hadn't yet been released iPhone was just 3G. Around the world, according to Cisco's VNI report, people were consuming 91 petabytes per month of mobile data, a, a number that probably doesn't mean that much to most of us aside from you know, Henning and Elliot. Um, but by 2014, that number had increased by two orders of magnitude to 2,582 petabytes per month. And in 2009, less than half of Americans had mobile broadband even 3G, which passed for mobile broadband then. But by the end of 2013, there were more subscriptions than there were inhabitants of the United States, more mobile subscriptions. So it was a pivotal time. On the one hand, mobile broadband was exploding. And on the other hand, there were no plans to increase the amount of spectrum that was available for mobile broadband. So the spectrum policy team at the FCC identified the need, explained it to the world, mostly through the National Broadband Plan, set a goal of 500 megahertz of additional spectrum for mobile fixed and unlicensed broadband use within 20, 10 years, of which 300 megahertz should be available for mobile flexible use within five years, laid out a plan for getting there, began executing that plan, adjusted as we went, and then adapted it where needed. Uh, and, you know, largely we've, we've gotten there and, or we're, let me just say we're on, we're on a good path. And, this is much on our minds um, in part because next month on November 13th, if all goes according to plan, knock on wood, the AWS 3 auction will commence. And this is a major tranche of spectrum that can be used to expand the workhorse AWS 1 band that's currently used for cell phone service. So bear with me for a moment while, we, while I walk through how we got to this point because in 2010, it was by no means clear that by 2014, we would be able to auction 50 megahertz of paired spectrum that would be usable in, the, in a relatively near time, near time frame for cell phone, for mobile broadband. It wasn't a foregone conclusion in 2010 that the band should be auctioned on a paired basis. There were competing visions for the band. There was uncertainty about whether the uplink band, the uplink band which was and still is allocated for government use, could be freed up and, and made available. There was an intensive multi-stakeholder public-private process, for the most part with bipartisan, bicameral support. And over five years, this involved a presidential memorandum, multiple NTIA reports, multiple FCC decisions, an industry roadmap proposed by the wireless industry, an alternative plan proposed by the Department of Defense, five CSMAC working groups, a technical panel review of agency transmission plans, transition plans, and more meetings than you could count. What really happened was that there was a group of people that got together um, that initially couldn't agree, but eventually came to a common answer, and a small group of people in the agencies and companies and on Capitol Hill helped keep the, moving, the process moving, and there was a very high degree of engagement from the industry, which helped. So it was a lot of time and effort, and I think anybody who was involved in the process would not count on things being easier the next time around. It's particularly if sharing becomes more prevalent, it just, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of effort. So what do we take from this experience? John Leibovitz, who is one of the heroes of the AWS 3 story, has a quote from Bill Gates above his desk, and this is what it says. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years 
and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. So some rules, like technical rules, are ideally written closer in time to when the spectrum is being put to use. But there are certain types of spectrum policy decisions that have to be made years in advance in order to enable the availability of additional spectrum. And this includes opportunities for reallocation and for sharing. If we aren't thinking five to 10 years out, we will constantly be playing catch up. Flexible use spectrum has helped tremendously in that it allows the market to drive spectrum to new uses, but we're very far from having an, a spectrum allocated entirely for flexible use. And a lot of it is licensed or allocated in ways that make it impossible for the market to change the use by itself. Government intervention is required. There's also been a certain amount of creativity required. We've developed some new regulatory approaches, the incentive auctions, which are two-sided auctions, um, the new, uh, new approaches of proposed for 3.5 gigahertz, but they all take time to develop and they take a lot of time to vet because you don't want unintended consequences and you need to think through the, the implications of, of doing things a different way. So again, best to be continually thinking about these things. And finally, and I think this is consistent with what both John and um, Howard have said, future planning means keeping an open mind. We have to be willing to adjust. If you thought about unlicensed spectrum 20, 25 years ago, you would not not necessarily have predicted that it would become so valuable to the economy and to so many people and so many uses. So while planning ahead is essential, it's not a rigid central planning exercise we need to allow for the technological and marketplace changes of the type that the first two panels described. Thank you. So first, let me let um, So there are, uh, there are two questions that have that have come in via email, and we'll go to hands because I'll just tell you right now. One of them is a question that none of these three people can answer, which is to say, "Oh, should we change the regulatory jurisdiction among the three of you?" I will tell you right now, none of them is willing to. An oh, how are you going to answer that question? I'll take it. Go, go. <laughs> I mean, I'll take the jurisdiction. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. yes Thanks. Okay. All right. So I'm wrong. All right. So Howard is willing to 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 to, to answer to answer that question. Um, um, and then, and then another uh, another question that come in. I think that you all um, that you all can respond to, although you may want to fight the premise of the question, um, which is why has the government in, in its regulation here stepped away from an economic focus and reasoning, economic focus and reasoning, when much of Ronald Coase and his, and his commission testimonies back in the fifties, as we know, were instrumental in the in, in the evolution of telecommunications policy and protecting the public interest by focusing on economics. Um, but, but, but I, I'll quarrel with the premise, but I think I'm going to defer to the former FCC chief economist. <laughs> yeah, I also will, will, uh, will quarrel with, with the premise. I, I don't think that there's a lack of an economic approach. I think that the questions are fundamentally different, or many of the questions are fundamentally different. And um, we're really dealing with a lot of economic questions that have to do what is the dynamically correct path. I actually love that quote from Bill Gates, of which I was unaware. But um, I do think we overestimate what's going to happen in the next two years and either underestimate or misestimate um, what's going to happen over the next 10. And so the economics of sort of what, the, what will lead to uh, the optimal path of, of change, I think, are extremely complicated and very different from what will statically maximize welfare in a, in a, in a current trading relationship. So I don't think there's been a move away from an economic approach. I just think a lot of the salient questions are different and involve some different kinds of economic thinking on which I think there's less empirical understanding and less well worked out economic models. And I might just add, I think the answer might be different when you're talking about spectrum policy and when you're talking about the kinds of competition and interconnection policy issues. I think on the spectrum policy side, there has been just an increasing uh, influence of economists, particularly game theorists, as we move towards auctions, different kinds of auctions 
um, just Jonathan Levy can tell you that the economists are integral to the a lot of the spectrum policy processes. On the interconnection and competition side, as John Sallet mentioned in his speech, the FCC's uh, mandate, statutory mandate, is broader than, even when it's doing transactional analysis, is broader than the DOJ or the FTC and encompasses the public interest, which means that while we, we do uh, take into account economic and competition considerations, we also need to look at other aspects of the public interest, including free speech, uh, et cetera. Uh, is it on? Okay. Uh, I wanted to pick up, Rebecca Arbogast from Comcast, I wanted to pick up on one of the themes that Howard talked about and asked him and John and Ruth their thoughts on it, because I know all of them have thought about this a lot. And it's the over-enforcement, under-enforcement issue, which I think for all of us is something we've all been grappling with and all the various jobs we've had and issues that we're looking at. And I think it's more, it's probably more of an art than a science, and it's probably as much cultural and political as it is something that's concrete, legal, or economic. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on, over time, how do you think about which is the right way to air over enforcement or under enforcement? Does it depend upon the particular type of question? Does it depend on macroeconomic environment? Just what are the things that we should be thinking about as we try to set that scale? I mean, I think that the answer to it's hard to generalize about the answer to that. Um, it's going to turn in part on, um, you know, the economic problem that is at issue. And if, you know, if you think that under enforcement will lead to cascade effects that cannot be undone, um, then that is going to be your primary preoccupation and you will err on the side of regulating. Um, but. Uh, I mean, it, there needs to be some sort of empirical demonstration that that is true before you engage in um, preemptive regulation. Um, and it ultimately just comes to a question of burden shifting. I mean, it, I think Howard is exactly right that we in the U.S. tend to have more faith in private markets to reach um, efficient pro-consumer outcomes than uh, European countries do. And it's... Um, it's sort of interesting to watch the different results that you get in these these two settings. I, I would agree with everything John just said. I want to just articulate two things that I think might be necessary in thinking about it. I, I have you know, sort of my own preferences in this debate, uh, maybe because I'm an American and, and not a European. But I do think that anybody who wants to make a case for um, risks of over-enforcement being preferable to risks of under-enforcement um, needs on, in a particular case to, to be able to articulate two things. One is the probability that the regulation will in fact be improving. And when we talk about the internet backbone, you know, I think John quite rightly pointed to the continued relevance now 15 years on of Michael Kendi's 2000 paper I think we have to ask some real questions. Even if problems can be identified, what is the argument that the proposed regulatory fix will actually improve things in such a, a, a complex environment? So I think there has to be a very good case for the fix. And I think there has to also be a case for irreversibility um, if you were to under-enforce and go the wrong way. I think if you can articulate both of those things, there is a case for early intervention and for running the risk that that intervention may not work out terrifically. But those would be the two variables I would focus on in each case. So I'll just add that I think you have to be a regular policymaker, has to be willing to revisit predictions that are made. So for example, when Chairman Powell was making some of the reg regulatory decisions that Howard referred to, he was also giving speeches that predicted there would be five or six pipes into the home, that broadband over power lines would materialize in a very significant way. Um, now, many things have happened in the intervening 
uh, 10 years, but some of the things that I think the commission predicted at the time have not. So I would just say that if you're going to use the tendency to under enforcement or the wait and see, you have to accompany that with monitoring, collecting the data, monitoring it, and being willing to course correct if needed. Just like to, to, if I could just add one more point. People have mentioned Michael Powell's um, 2004 speech about internet freedoms a couple times. There are two things that are noteworthy about that. One is um, he didn't come up with those four principles um, off the top of his head. I mean, he um, he spoke at great length with various stakeholders, including consumer groups, about what are the basic interests that we need to preserve, and um, and that, that was the origin of, of those four principles. Now, they were also, the other thing that's interesting about them is they were non-binding. I mean, they were just exhortations to observe these four rules. Um, this has become sort of the norm in telecom regulation over the last dozen years. Um, carriers are increasingly, in carriers, providers generally are engaged in a sort of dance with the FCC where um, the FCC expresses concerns, um, the carriers push back a little bit, um, and the policies that emerge from this, as often as not, are, are not actually written down in formal regulations, but they nonetheless affect carrier behavior. And that may be, as, as in the case of inter, in the three interconnection um, debates that I was talking about earlier, that may be, to some extent, an efficient solution because it gives both the industry and the regulator a lot of flexibility to adjust as uh, conditions evolve and avoids the problem of bright line rules that may have unintended consequences. So now, so now we're getting back up on questions. So I have uh, Sharon and uh, Bruce, who just, who just walked out, and Danny and Elliot and Henning, or Henning and Danny. So, but let, Sharon, let me see that you start. Oh, wait. I'm going to give you this. Let me start with you first. Your question was so clear, I can probably just read it, but you also asked it. Okay. Uh, my question is actually for John. Thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I, I just wanted to address, first of all, something that may have been confusing about something I said. I think mostly you heard what I was saying. I did have something on the slide that I didn't speak, which was that I, I see those arbitration provisions that I was talking about as dealing with anti-competitive foreclosure concerns more than with pricing and monopoly pricing concerns. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. The second was just related to that. I was interested in your thought that ar binding arbitration is, is uh, or arbitration generally is somehow um, distortive. I was trying to understand what you meant by that, so I wondered if you could amplify. Sure. Um, Obviously, most um, business negotiations um, don't take place against the backdrop of binding arbitration in the event of an impasse. Um, the competitive dynamic is informed to a great extent by the ability of either party just to walk away. Um, if you have a background rule that an individual arbitrator gets to pick an outcome for a given party, you will create a dynamic in which either of the parties may choose to take their chances with the arbitrator rather than acquiesce in whatever commercial solution would otherwise emerge. Sometimes it's useful to do that, but if the market is not is fundamentally sound, if it's working without that mechanism, I think you need to go somewhat slowly into a new regime where you could, um, where you could change the, the negotiating dynamics. So um, I don't know. Here, here was Bruce's question. Bruce, you can add to it if you want. Tony Pettis has the microphone there. Um, this is Bruce Gottlieb, who's already been invoked in the back. Um, Jean Tirol won the Nobel Prize for his work uh, on network access pricing. What do you think about how the U.S. and other countries have incorporated and not incorporated his thinking? And why do you think the experience has been fairly different? No, oh, he's, he's, he's back. He's back there. I don't, know if you want, I don't know if you want to add to that. So I, I'm interested also in, in thoughts on the ideas themselves, but but also um, how the the different experience uh, internationally in the U.S. Um, sheds light on on how economic ideas affect policy. 
Um, you know, Jean's ideas have, I think, been incredibly influential in a variety of places, although uh, after being awarded the prize, Jean did point out that he's yet to receive a phone call from his own government and uh, <laughs> made clear that his services were available. I thought that was, that was fairly interesting. So his, his, um, his, his, his influence problem may not, be, may not be limited to the United States. Um, no, I'm, but, but I actually do think Jean has had a major uh, influence in thinking about what the right mechanism is for getting efficient uh, interconnection pricing as you're emerging from a monopoly environment. I think that um, the reason that there have been different approaches, and in some sense, um, he has his ideas, whether attributed to him or not, have been more successful, for example, in France than in the US, it has to do with a lot of different history of the, of the networks. You know, we never had a PTT here. So at the time that we went into unbundling regulation and questions about uni pricing emerged, and Jean did come and talk to the FCC right around the time of the 1996 Act. I mean, he was in there sort of, sort of pushing a variety of, of thoughts about telework pricing. And you know, there were smart people to listen to him. Joe Farrell was there in the room you know, hearing these ideas. So I don't think it was a question of his ideas not being appreciated or fully implemented as being implemented in a context that was very different. In France, you had a national network where you were taking employees of that network and turning some of them into the regulators. So they knew exactly what was in the network, exactly what was going on, exactly what the sort of institutional thinking was. And so when you look at unbundling pricing in France and how they've gone about creating all of these, uh, all of the, you know, a very robust resale market, it's just happening in a completely different context from what we had here. You don't have takings issues. You don't have, uh, you don't have the history of, of, of the private network. So I think, you know, it'd be great. I'd like to actually have a longer talk about Jean's ideas particularly, but for purposes of right now, I would say um, the implementability of those ideas was probably very different because of the different institutional context out of which the unbundling networks were, were emerging. Uh, all right, we can get a mic to Danny in front. Oh, Danny and then Henry, Danny, then Henry, then Hi, uh, so I, I think I'll ask my question a little bit more uh, rhetorically than I wrote it. Uh, I'm interested in your views about whether we have uh, enough data, whether you as regulators have enough data to make any of these kinds of, of decisions about our, our, our risk tolerance for over or under regulation, our risk tolerance for over or under enforcement. Um, I, I'll say I, I'm sort of staggered by how little data we have. We heard about um, just a little bit of the work that Casey Claffey at, at CADA does, which is um, kind of a lone voice in, um, in, in this space to, to a large extent. I'm just interested in your sense of uh, Picking up on, on Bill Lair's view, we're, we're heading into this environment where we're going to have a substantial dependence on, on, on market forces. We're going to, regulators are trying to kind of thread their way through that, um, assess the effectiveness of those forces towards whatever our goals are. I'm just interested in how we're going to get to a path where we actually have a, able to have a more, uh, a more well-informed discussion. Why don't I start? So one of the examples John Sallet gave in his speech was the special access data collection, which, so this is data we don't have today, hopefully we'll have by the end of the year, um, you know, which we worked through with OIRA, the costs and benefits of collecting the data, because anytime you collect data, it impose, that itself imposes costs on the industry. Um, so do we have the data today? Uh, in certain areas we do, and in certain areas we probably don't. And I would Where just... Do That's a good question, which probably requires more thought. It seems like we need, it's not just more data, but more 
refined data perhaps we're not I'm not sure we're always asking the right questions of the right folks but I think I think it's a fantastic question that requires more thought than I have than I can give you in 30 seconds though these guys may have answers I have a particular institutional perspective on this because I work at an agency that um, is to a large extent involved in the business of collecting um, data that will inform competition policy. So, I mean, one obvious example of this is the study that we are commencing into patent assertion entities in which we are gathering an extraordinarily useful set of data about um, the extent to which there is or is not a policy problem and what the appropriate um, solutions might be. Hats off to Howard for letting us do that as, as, as well. <laughs> but I, I, I do think that this, this is something that policymakers ought to be focusing on. I'm very happy to be part of an agency that does focus on it. And I, um, and I think if you're going to intervene in markets, you owe it to those markets to understand them very well. There, there's... There's never as much data as one would ideally like. Um, and so, you know, I think as Ruth put it, we, we have to think about where there's sufficient utility to gathering the data that it's worth, that it's worth those costs. But I think there are two, two questions embedded in, in your very good question. One is in a particular marketplace, how do we obtain enough data to really understand what is going on to establish useful metrics for what would constitute competition, what constitutes um, a, a well-functioning market. I think there's something else, though, that can be done, which is, um, and this is where academics and, and people who, um, you know, and, and people who in whatever context do scholarship and research can be extremely helpful. There's the kind of data that allows us to make presumptions and to draw analogies from one market to another, and I think uh, retrospective studies of what has happened in markets that have been regulated or not been regulated. Um, retrospective studies of what has actually happened against predictions from the past in particular markets uh, can be extremely helpful. Um, we may learn a lot there that may not tell us exactly the facts on the ground for a particular enforcement decision, but may help us to know whether we ought to be more or less modest. Is this a market like hospital mergers where non-enforcement proved very costly? And we may want to think very differently then about uh, how we go forward and what presumptions we, we adopt in uh, uh, hospital mergers. Or is this a market like some others that one might think of where uh, regulation proved quite costly by altering the innovation path or slowing things down, and, and people have their favorite examples there. Um, I think by doing a lot of, uh, of such retrospective analyses, uh, we can start to understand what kinds of factors are salient in making either under enforcement or over enforcement uh, desirable. And then we have the ability to use a somewhat limited data set. Okay. To what extent are these salient factors present in this market? Is it more like the one where over enforcement was a problem or more like the one where under enforcement was a problem? So I think that's something you know, that is, is, is sort of a pitch and a plea that I make to people advising graduate students, to people doing their own research, um, uh, to, to try to get those kinds of empirical studies out there. I think those are going to be increasingly vital to public policy. The uh, ability to learn lessons from empirical studies is going to depend a lot on the markets. And obviously, the more disruptive the market is, the harder it is to draw uh, interpretations uh, from them. I, I think I'm very happy to hear that the FCC is reinvigorating its, its special access uh, proceeding. That's an area where um, I, I think the uh, the time has come for a serious reevaluation of, of those issues. I think I wanted uh, just to come back to Ruth and uh, interesting remarks about the pain and suffering uh, in the AWS3 um, effort. What I was curious about, my, if I were to take your lesson, it was one where it's like a war, you can only fight so many of those uh, because the soldiers get tired. Uh, and war wounded and whatever. Uh, 
So I wonder if you were to look at, do you see more battles like AWS plea and um, um, just muster all the troops and see if we can win one, one more? Or uh, do you see that that's essentially been kind of the last battle of the old style where we need to find other mechanisms and I'd be curious what those might be. Uh, well, we ha could you imagine more uh, explicit incentive auctions in, in other areas? Uh, that, or simply saying, well, give up on the below of 3 gigahertz band, let's all move to my whatever, 24 and above, or whatever the case may be. So I'm curious if you have ideas uh, as a war-wounded veteran, or at least a observer of some, uh, as to how we should uh, move forward in the 2020 or beyond time frame. So the 24 gigahertz and above that Henning refers to, the commission this morning adopted a notice of inquiry into uh, uses, including mobile uses in the millimeter wave band, so much higher up where the bandwidth can be very large, although the distances are very short and whether they could be used in heterogeneous networks so that you have these very short, uh, very small cells, perhaps with, you know, with a macro cell as well. And what would we need to do as policymakers to get that spectrum? Now, there's lots of spectrum there, and a lot of it isn't very heavily used. So that's clearly one source. There's tremendous focus right now, as you know, resources on the broadcast incentive auction. Um, the current statute doesn't accommodate the use of an incentive auction or very creative types of payments to government agencies, but various people in various parts of, the, of Washington are thinking, and, and outside of Washington, are thinking about those issues. Um, and I also, I think this is one where the kind of constant reevaluation that we've been talking about um, is necessary because sometimes it's a spectrum that is very intensively used for one purpose now, a decade from now, and this probably isn't a 2020 thing, but a decade from now, we might, we might not be using, and I'm not going to call out anybody um, in particular, but it might be that it can be an application on, a, on LTE or it could be an application on an unlicensed in an unlicensed band rather than meeting its own dedicated spectrum. Howard or John? This is, then this is your chance for, unless we, for closing thoughts before I have a closing thought. And Howard and John, this is your chance. If there's anything, if there's any valedictory, valedictory statements you want to make before I, before I conclude. Do I start now? Do I start now? <laughs> um, so, um, so I actually just want to, uh, just want to say, with relevance to this, uh, you know, to this panel and to some of the to some of the issues that it's uh, been talking about, I actually was particularly struck. I I had seen that in John's office, but I had forgotten that it that it, that the the great um, Bill Gates quote because it is interesting. One of the themes from things that Paul Dassault and others were saying today is, in many ways, it does feel like we're we feel anyway, we're like we're fairly locked in, lots in lots of ways in in facilities, and yet think about how quickly uh, that the PSTN changed. We all, we all had the experience of talking to people who, were, uh, who had worked in the landline world, and it seemed like the landline world would always be dominant and would always be a, a bottleneck until, until all of a sudden it wasn't. Um, and so I think, I think the quotation, uh, I think the quotation gets, it, uh, gets it exactly right in a sort of a nice place, um, a nice place for us to, uh, to end even a couple of minutes early. Before I do, I just want to say, um, a couple of uh, quick thank yous. So one, when you're leaving, please thank Julie Mouchon, who's out there, who's done heroic work in setting up, uh, in setting up this conference. And I also want to thank Jim Spetta and Artie Rye, who have, who have heroically been, been sitting here and, uh, and going through all of this. And I want to thank all of you. I think it's been a great conference, a really great conversation. Um, pardon me? Oh, and I'm sorry. And where's Tony Pettis? And Tony Pettis, I'm sorry. Thank you. And Tony also. I, 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 I apologize. Pardon me? Student at Duke. Right. Um, all right. So thanks to everybody. There is He's now. A student at Duke Law School. Right. I, so thanks to everybody. There is now uh, alcohol available in the reception. That's the most important thing. So now we can all go, we can all go get a right. drink. Thanks, right. thanks to everybody for a great conference. It's a Friday. Yeah, exactly.